Are you looking to create a polished game using assets from the asset store? In this video, I'll show you how to transform store-bought assets into the game you see here. Now, the game I'm showing in this video won't be the game you're working on. Of course it won't. You might not even be going for a realistic aesthetic. However, I expect you'll find a little snippet here or there in this video amongst the categories that I'll be covering that will help you in developing your game. Now, the game I've been working on for the last few months is an isometric twin stick shooter investigative story driven game. Yeah, that's quite a mouthful. It's set in our world at present day, but will lead our main character into a world of tech akin to magic. Yes, magic is real, you haters. Go fight me in the comments. So let's start with the environments where our character will live, get killed multiple times and resurrected, unless I intentionally annoy the player enough to rage quit. Now, scouring the asset store will find thousands of environments to choose from. For this video, I've chosen a smattering of environments, and like all my videos, any assets will have a link in the description if you want to pick them up for yourself. Now, outside of the environment looking pretty, when choosing them, I like to consider how modular the environment is, and how easy it will be to create custom levels with it. Now this sci-fi pack comes with a nice sample scene showing it off. And if we dive in deep, we can see the scene is made up of very granular sections. As you can see here with the different wall choices fitting into the wall section. Compare this to a whole singular wall section of another pack that we can only fit together with this same wall section. And it kind of limits some of our flexibility when creating those unique levels. Now, if I was heading outdoors, I like it when the pack has a good amount of foliage with plants like ferns and ivy, as you can see here that help break up the ground texture. This particular forest pack is from Nature Manufacturer. So let's dive into lighting. And for this example, I have picked out the retro farmhouse from the publisher, Not Lonely. In my game, the player will walk up to a guy sitting in a chair in one of the rooms. After all, what's a story game without quest givers? Now, I'm using mixed lighting in my game with a static set of geometry baked and real-time shadows for the dynamic elements, like the character, for instance. The great news is, with this sample scene, we have pretty good lighting set up from the get-go. So only a few adjustments and adding the elements that I want, like a lamp to draw the player's eyes to the guy sitting in the room. And also, I'll need to set some of these lights to mixed, as they were baked from the start. Next, I'll give the player a little more realistic lighting. As they move around the scene, we will add in some light probes and of course, some reflection probes. And lastly, we will put that all into bake and wait for the results. Now a quick tip here is I find the GPU light mapper oftentimes will be faster for my setup. And I will always start with a lower light map size and resolution to get an idea of how the lighting is working before I ramp them up for the final bake. It really saves off some iteration time when you're starting to move lights around and you're having to bake it constantly. Now, obviously, with different environments leads to different lighting setups. But let me know if you want me to do a singular video just on mixed lighting and I'll endeavor to get one put out. Now, performance wise, I want to next get into some occlusion culling setup. Now, a small scene like this, it isn't so important because you don't have so many assets, but jump into larger worlds and you could really see a frame boost. With this scene, it's pretty easy to set up. And with an isometric view, we can see the scene cull behind the character as they move along. Now, obviously with an FPS, if you're looking down a long corridor with lots of open doors, you'll need to be more aware of those sight lines and maybe consider putting in a dog leg or closing some of those doors as you move through them. So as I mentioned, I'm using all these assets from the store in my game, and I've been working on it for the last few months. It is obviously very early on and a real work in progress, but in the coming months, I will start putting out devlog videos. And because I'm a punctual little developer, I will also have a coming soon page on Steam. Check out the description to see if I made it in time for this video. If the link is there, you might want to consider helping another indie developer and wishlisting it. So what would this game be without its characters? Here's a mean looking one in particular from Proto Factor. Now, why did I pick this character and this publisher? Well, they look awesome. And with the amount of variety I get with a publisher like Proto Factor, I know I can keep a consistent art style while having a varied set of enemies. Now, aside from looking great, I also want them to be rigged and ready to go. 
I don't want to have to get in and set up the bones and skin weighting myself. Now this game I'm working on won't just have shooting, it won't be its main focus anyway. It will sit hand in hand with a little detective work and some puzzling. But I still want the shooting to fill on the polish side. Now what does that mean? Well, obviously some screen shake, some good audio, etc. But what does that mean for the characters? Well sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes, I want an enemy death to feel a little more visceral. So in the case of these zombies, it doesn't hurt to hit that stereotype on the head of them being hit on the head. When picking this particular character, I want to make sure that it comes with body parts rather than a single mesh. It saves me using a saw in the modeling software of my choice to remove the head myself. Also, with my game, another consideration is variance in enemies. It can be really helpful if a character comes with a few alternate skins. It's not a showstopper if enemies all look the same, we as gamers are kind of used to that, but with a few skins you can help set up an enemy, the same enemy, with the same stats and behaviours, but get two for the price of one, with that extra skin moving around. Now let's move on to animations. After all, what would motivate our characters to move without them? You'll note that a lot of characters from the store will come with animations. Sometimes a lot of animations, sometimes the bare bones just to get them to move around. Now for standard humanoids with rigs, there is a huge amount of animation packs to get hold of, pretty much covering the gambit of every action imaginable. Now, my game is not a zombie game. It has zombies, but it's not a zombie game. It also has critters and creatures that come with their own unique pros and cons. Take this cute little guy. Now he's a biped, but not all bipeds are created equally. Some come as a generic setup rather than a humanoid. And for good reason. Look at the little critter with his stubby little legs. He has a particular secret. And we get to see that secret if we set him to humanoid and apply a walk cycle from a standard asset pack. Pretty sure I'm going to have to layer that tongue if I want to use this walk cycle. So you want to make sure for creatures like this, they come with all the animations you need, unless you want to jump into your favorite animating software and get it to work yourself. Or if you have it, Umotion Pro. That will enable you to get to work directly in Unity, both on humanoid and generic rigs, and make your own animations. Or take an animation from one of the packs and alter it to your needs. But enough about our biped dominated world. Let's start talking exotic, like our centipede looking friend here. When buying this one, I made sure he had all the animations I wanted. The likelihood of me finding a different animation for him, well, it's non-existent. And making a new one, although this creature is well rigged, it would seriously take my animation skills a lot of time to produce. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about root motion animations, as they're used in my game, as well as a lot of others. Now, for a large swathe of my critters, they will use root motion animation. However, if you choose not to in your game, it's fine. Just remember to speed match the animation. Nobody likes an ice skating fish monster. Of course, a lot of the best animation packs come with both already in them, like this ultimate animation collection from Protofactor. Well, if you hadn't guessed it by now, the sponsor for this video is Unity. They asked what assets I would recommend to people and I highlighted the ones I'm actually using in my game. After all, I want to dog food my recommendations. Now the promotion on the asset store right now contains most of the assets you see in this video. And I've left affiliate links in the description if you want to support the channel by bulking out your asset library. Now I know from experience how long it would take me to create a beautiful forest to nature manufacturer's standards. And as far as creating a character like the ones from Protofactor, well, you can just forget about it. So the promotion happening right now will hopefully shine more light on these great publishers. And just a quick note for any of the newcomers who followed the Unity Asset Store page to this channel. Firstly, welcome. The devlog for this game is incoming, and while you wait, there are over 100 advanced tips, tricks, and tooling videos ready for you to binge. But fair warning, this isn't really a beginner zone. I don't make any my first game videos, and my first game I ever made was a Duck Hunt clone in the early 90s, so Flappy Bird style games are long dead to me as well. So, on with the video, and I won't leave this section till last, even though I know most of us developers kind of do, and that's audio. Now, I have one major gripe to get past which puts me off an audio supplier, and that's if the audio they're supplying is kind of dirty. But what do I mean by that? Well, take for example when we enter a small room 
and we want some reverb on our audio. Now, I don't want that reverb baked into the audio because then I'm gonna need an unreverbed one as well. Instead, I will have a clean version of the audio and simply add a reverb zone like you see me doing here, or I'll add a script that does a mixer adjustment. If you thought simply adding reverb and altering your sounds was polish, then we have a long way to go. In fact, that could probably on its own spin into a whole new video. But I wanna to touch on something in games like this action one I'm creating, and that's dynamic or adaptive music. You see, picture the scene. You're in a fight with a zombie. Now, a single zombie is no issue for our detective, so we're gonna ignore any sort of action-orientated music. But add in another, and it's a little bit more intense. So let's intensify with some action music. Now we're adding another zombie. And then maybe a couple more. And now we have a party, you see, so the music needs to adjust accordingly with techno. Which is the placeholder right now, but you get the point. It's much more intense. Now what we're doing is we're using our mixer to turn on extra stems onto an already playing set of stems, just to boost the intensity. So when I look for dynamic music on the asset store, I'm looking for ones that break out the stems into a separate track. So I can have the drums and techno beat separately, like you hear here. For ambience and general music, I kind of have one main rule, and that's it has to loop well and not make me want to plug my ears because it's so awful in its repetitiveness. Just know if it irritates you when you're making the game, then your long-term players may feel the same way. Even if you like it, always, always have a music off section in your settings. Now, I'll be the first to admit that at present, my game lacks on the audio design front. Yes, I include myself in the whole leaving audio till last, but I do plan on getting all the design and mechanics in for audio by the time I finish the vertical slice of this game, which hopefully will be pretty soon. Also kind of light at the moment, in this game is the VFX. Shooting walls will create little puffs, some lights will come in with some volume, and of course enemies dissolve when you kill them. Trust me, this gets explained later, and there is a good reason for it in the plot, not just because it helps with optimization and saves me playing around with ragdolls a lot. But the grenades button is missing, a lot of love, and the red barrels are still being painted. So let's lean on, talk about the state of VFX on the asset store. Right now, VFX is sort of in a halfway house. Since the interjection of the visual asset graph, you'll be getting either those graphs, or more likely, but still fine, the older particle systems. Now, personally, I like to work in the new visual effect graph but I will roll with updating the existing particle system over replacing it with a graph for a quicker turnaround. If you're just getting into the visual effect graph, then seeing some examples is one of the best ways to learn it. Unity has a good set of example packs and tutorials, but I'd also recommend the ones you see here by Gabriel. He has a great YouTube channel where he breaks them all down and his packs tend to be very well made. One of the graphs I'm using from his pack is this portal. It's sort of a reveal in my game. Even if the original didn't fit the aesthetic just right, I was able to tweak the variables because they're so extensive. I just wanted to make the portal a little less colorful just to fit in with this dark scene. Now, as a bonus for sticking with me to this point, I wanna offer up one more category, and that is UI. You see, whether it's a HUD or your main menu or any menu, most games are gonna have some UI for you to view and click on. For any of my games, the main points when I'm choosing UI package is that it's consistent in its interface and it has a fine grain of modularity. There's nothing worse, really nothing worse, than seeing an awesome example on the store page and finding it's one single sprite. It annoys me no end. So I've chosen here to adapt the Mitski Reach UI pack because I saw all the menu pages I wanted to create shown in the examples. And I knew these packs were really modular because I bought them in the past and I know they do a great job with their tools for allowing you to tailor the UI really easily. Now for polish, for me, revolves around intuitive navigation. 
so I switched out some of the buttons for consistency and simplicity, and I tweaked some of the transitions between menus and button animations to enhance the user interaction without distracting or overwhelming the user. And I changed the audio on the buttons to make them a little bit more subtle. Well, that was a lot to run through, and I hope there were at least some insights that you managed to walk away with. As always, I'm happy to do a deeper dive into anything that stood out, so just let me know what you'd like me to expand on in the comments. I'd like to thank Unity again for sponsoring this video and supporting this channel's community. And with that, I will head off and think about my imposter syndrome. Yes, even after all this time, it still lives with me, like it's constantly five minutes past midnight and the mugwai on my shoulder is subscribed to that all-you-can-eat buffet.